The war between Earth and the alien force known collectively as Imperiex has begun in earnest. Imperiex probes have landed all over the globe, shattering the defensive alien armada and the JLA. All across the globe, following the orders of President Lex Luthor, Earth's heroes battle the armored aliens. And they are losing. Wonder Woman destroyed one probe while in space, but in doing so, she was badly injured. Aquaman fought to defend his underwater kingdom of Atlantis, and he also destroyed a probe. But in a swirling cascade of crimson waters, he and Atlantis disappeared. Struggling to keep up is Clark Kent, better known as Superman, who was bounced from one disaster to the next. His parents might be dead, his friends are critically wounded, and now one of them has seemingly died. The time is drawing close for drastic, some might say suicidal, actions. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 13.4, Our Worlds at War, part 4. The Adventures of Superman issue 594 was written by Joe Casey, penciled by Mike Ringo, inked by Larry Stucker and Oakley, possibly Bill Oakley, but I can't seem to confirm that, and it was colored by Wildstorm Effects. We open the issue on the moon, where a silent Superman approaches a blocky gray structure, the JLA Watchtower. He floats through the punched-in door, discovering a seemingly empty hallway. Moon dust floats in the... Well, air isn't quite right, because there's no air on the moon, but you get the idea. Metal debris is scattered on the floor, leading Superman around a corner, where he finds the mangled body of Shrapnel. We last saw this metal villain in Adventures of Superman issue 593 as a member of President Luthor's new Suicide Squad. Now he looks like a beer can that was smashed against someone's forehead. I don't know if Shrapnel can actually die, because, you know, he's made of metal, but he sure ain't getting back up right now. Superman's thoughts take us back in time about an hour, where we find him at the Oval Office chest to chest, with President Luthor. Behind the pair are Amanda Waller, who oversees the Suicide Squad, and General Rock, Luthor's main military advisor. Superman isn't happy about being asked to work with Luthor, but the President knows that this isn't the time for petty squabbles. Imperiex is perhaps the single greatest threat the Earth has ever faced. This is a war, and Superman should consider himself drafted. Hmm, <laughs> what a great line. Luthor asks General Rock to brief Superman, and so he does. The team that they sent to the moon has stopped transmitting back, and Superman grunts. Yeah, did you honestly think that this was a good idea, sending uncontrollable supervillains into the field? General Rock angrily asks if Superman has ever served in a forward area, but it's Waller who really lays into him. Who the f- No swearing! Is he to question their decisions? And they've got one of his cronies along specifically to keep those people under control. And Superman blinks. Wait, wait, who did you send? Luthor interrupts this dressing down, trying to keep Waller from turning this into a full-blown argument. Given everything that's happened so far in this conflict, they can't waste any time fighting amongst themselves. Superman acting now can save lives. So shouldn't he? These flashbacks continue as Superman moves deeper into the facility. He discovers the massive unconscious form of Chemo next. After restoring gravity, Superman catches the large being and sets him on the floor. In the next flashback, Superman challenges General Rock. What actions are you taking in all of this? General Rock explains that Major Lane the father of Lois Lane, a.k.a. Superman's father-in-law, is directing the perimeter defense of Washington, D.C. If Imperiex heads for the White House, he is not getting through. Plus, the military has activated the Black Hawk Air Corps, who are armed with the best aerial combat craft that the U.S. has developed. With all the stakes that are on the board right now, the question is whether or not Superman is going to do his part. 
not the military. But we know that Superman has done his part, and he next finds the alien warlord Mongol lying on the floor. Blood runs down Mongol's yellow face and is pooling on the floor underneath. A shadowed figure speaks from behind Superman, and he turns to discover Manchester Black. A powerful telepath and telekinetic, Black has been drafted into the Suicide Squad as their field leader. But he is also an a-hole who has a personal mission to convince Superman that he should be killing his enemies. To Black, lethal force is always justified. So they really don't get along. Black confirms that the Suicide Squad has accomplished their mission, and that he has never seen anything so single-minded as the beast that they released. Superman remembers his final conversation with Luthor, one final hint about who the squad has been sent to release. Superman tells Luthor, Waller, and the General that he is going to remember this. Once this war is over, those in charge are going to be held accountable for the decisions that they made in the name of wartime necessity. Then, he left for the moon. On the moon, in the present time once more, Black condemns Superman's black and white way of looking at war. Us versus them, good versus bad, it's all trash. Everything in life is gray, man, it always is. He thinks that people shouldn't hide that fact or let it stop us. If it wasn't for that kind of thinking, then Superman's friend would never have gone with them, and he would never have been hurt. Waller teased this a few moments ago, that an ally of Superman's went with the squad. We finally get the reveal of who that is, as there is a cough nearby. Superman rushes to the inert form of John Henry Irons, better known as the superhero Steel. For the uninitiated, Steel was one of the men who stepped into the role of Superman after he was killed by the villain Doomsday back in 1993. Superman obviously came back, but Steel ended up sticking around as his own character and man, even serving on the Justice League. Steel is a black man, bald-headed, although he does have a goatee. He wears an armored exoskeleton that is gray and silver with a red cape, and of course he has the S-shield that all of the Superfamily wear on their chest. He also wields a long-handled hammer, like his namesake, John Henry, Steel is basically Iron Man, but make it Superman instead. And here he is, beaten and bleeding, his crushed-in helmet lying nearby. Steel mutters that he knew that Superman would arrive eventually, but at least they got the job done. Superman assures his friend that he'll get him to the med lab, but Steel turns it down. The med lab doesn't exist anymore. Not after what they let loose. And they, well, he, Steel adds that he knew what he was doing. He wasn't forced into this or tricked into it. Then he passes out. And Manchester Black is impressed. After the baiting that Steele took, Black is shocked that he can speak at all. Black then goes on. The majority of this team, Shrapnel, Chemo, Mongol, they were here as cannon fodder. Steele was here to get them in and to utilize the Watchtower's teleporters in order to free their target and it was Black's job to point the thing that they freed. Seems that their target has a specific focus on Superman. Well, thanks to Black's telepathy, the target now has a focus on Imperiax. Just point it, and release. So as far as he's concerned, mission accomplished. Black then steps into one of the teleporter tubes. He's nullified the nanotech that was threatening his life via his powers, so he's out of here. Black wishes Superman the best, and then he teleports out. Superman slow-mo reaches for the tube, not happy about a man like Manchester Black being on the loose again. But Steel stops him. He can't waste time on Black right now. Steel had never seen their target in action before. He never really knew what it could do. How it could beat Superman with nothing but its fists. Now that he has, Steel needs Superman to follow it. He needs to make sure that it gets the job done. Superman reports back to the military about what happened over the radio. The squad has lived up to its name, and they need medical attention now. Plus, Manchester Black has escaped, and he, meaning Superman, is going to head to the front lines. 
The narrative focus and our main storytelling techniques change here, so this is a good place to break things down a bit. First, author Casey does a really good job of building the suspense here. Interweaving the flashbacks with Superman's arrival at the Watchtower lent this issue a disjointed vibe. It's almost presented like a horror movie. The base is quiet, Superman is lost in his own thoughts, and as he moves further into the Watchtower, he finds the bodies of the Suicide Squad. The evidence of the fight that happened is everywhere. We've got the shattered building, the broken team. Since we saw how this team fared against Superman, we know the kind of force that it would take to do this kind of damage to them, implying that something at least as strong as Superman was let loose, and that it is much more ruthless. But all of that suspense is also kind of pointless. The cover of this issue is Superman's right arm curled into a fist against a black background, and next to it is Doomsday's arm. They aren't swinging at each other, they are moving together, implying that they are allies. Plus, the title font doesn't just say, The Adventures of Superman! It says, The Adventures of Superman and Doomsday! So Doomsday being here is spoiled at the jump, which is a great way to get fans asking what is going on and urge them to pick up the issue from the shelf, admittedly. But it also ruins all of the great suspense that Casey spends this whole issue building. Since I knew going into this that Doomsday was going to be allied with Superman at some point, I actually thought that the suspense was building to something else. And when it was revealed that it wasn't, I was kind of disappointed. Casey and Ringo absolutely killed the execution here, but they built suspense to something that isn't very suspenseful. Superman debating morality with President Luthor and his allies was pretty great. Sure, he can condemn the use of criminals in the Suicide Squad, but as General Rock points out, the forward area of combat is the most dangerous. No one knows what the people who are sent in first will encounter, so General Rock used the best team that they had in order to get that job done. But what I like here most is the sheer difference between Superman's perspective and the more traditional human's perspective. To some degree, Superman is still acting like the moral high ground is achievable, like this is still just another superhero brawl of the week. But the administration is treating this like it is a war, with lives on the line that must be defended, no matter the cost. If sacrificing the squad and unleashing Doomsday saves all life on planet Earth, isn't that worth it? Even if it is accomplished through morally reprehensible means? Because it kind of feels like it is. God, what a masterstroke of storytelling putting Luther in the White House was. I love this. I wish that Steele's actions and motives were more fully fleshed out, but to the best of my research, this comic is pretty much it. Luther obviously wanted Steel for the reasons that the story gives us, to activate the Watchtower's teleporters and to retrieve Doomsday from wherever the JLA was keeping him. But why would author Joe Casey choose Steel to do that? In theory, any member of the JLA should be able to operate the teleporter, and the rest of the League was clearly willing to take orders from the President. They did move to defend the Earth when Luther wanted them to, after all. But there are a couple of reasons why Casey picked Steel, the most prominent of them being his friendship with Superman and the trust that exists between them. Casey makes sure to have Steel tell Superman that he chose to go along with this mission, adding his seal of approval to it. Steel might never have encountered Doomsday before, but he understands how dangerous that thing is. After all, it killed Superman whose death sparked John Henry into becoming Steel, which changed his whole life. He wouldn't have done this if he didn't think that it had to be done. So while Superman might curse Luthor's plan and Steel's role in it, he has to wonder if maybe Luthor is in the right here. John Henry is also a brilliant engineer, like Luthor, and is a fairly practical man. If there was ever a member of the Super Family that Luthor could win over with a compelling argument, it's John Henry. Luthor is just paranoid and self-serving, while John Henry is trusting and self-sacrificing, as we all saw here. 
Manchester Black is still standing because one, he is too selfish to actually risk his life against Doomsday, and two, Casey uses him to explain to us the squad's mission here and how they aimed Doomsday at Imperiax. But he is also there to contrast Superman's mindset about all of this. Black argues that there is no moral high ground in war or in life, that everything is morally gray. And Superman just argued that things are always black and white. And he just argued it against Luthor, Waller, and General Rock in the White House. They're willing to send the squad to their death. They are willing to unleash Doomsday with possibly no hope of controlling him. And Superman promises to hold them accountable for these decisions. Everything is black and white, bad or good, to Superman, even when caught in a war. But John Henry allying with Luthor's plan challenges that form of thinking, while Manchester Black is the one who voices it. This is some f- No swearing. Great comics right here. For the next several pages, Casey changes the presentation of the story. The dialogue disappears, and the panels move to the right half of the page, leaving the left column open for text. The text is then presented as prose, describing first the history of Doomsday and Superman. As Superman closes in on the creature, the narration shifts back to Superman's mindset. He has died once before, but he came back from it. He was done with it. But here he is now, flying through the busted-up ships of the alien armada, surrounded by death, with even more death waiting for him. Memories of his fight with Doomsday begin to flash through his mind, the pain that he felt, the taste of his own blood, even eventually the welcoming embrace of sweet death. Doomsday was such an anomaly, something made of pure rage that had no motive, no heart, it was just physical force. It frightened Superman then, and it chills him now as he sees it once more. Doomsday is about the same height as Superman, maybe a little bit taller. It's beefier than Superman, for sure, thicker with dark, elephant-like skin. Rock-like bone growths sprout from Doomsday's knees, forearms, elbows, shoulders, jawline, forehead, and a small bit on its chest, right around the sternum. It also has on green shorts and boots, which looks super cute to me. But Doomsday is no joke. With one punch... Imperiax's head shatters, the detonation effect not even phasing Doomsday. For a moment, Superman considers killing Doomsday. It's not like anyone could stop him, right? Or would know. But what if Luthor is right? What if they need this engine of destruction? Instead, Superman joins him, blasting through Imperiax's chest from behind. His current opponent dead, Doomsday gloriously jumps ahead and tears into the next one. Together, the pair destroy one Imperiax probe after another, although it begins to take a toll on Superman. He ends up losing track of time as they fight, unsure if they've been fighting for hours or for days. His whole life has boiled down to kill the enemy, move, kill the next enemy. Normally, this is something that would tear Superman apart emotionally, So he's turned that part of himself off. He has just numbed himself emotionally. If emotions mean that he loses this fight, then he doesn't need those emotions. And this works. Unfettered by his conscience and unable to hurt any innocent bystanders out in space, the Imperiax probes fall like leaves. He wonders if this is what life is like for men like Luthor, acting with a complete lack of conscience. How can they live their whole lives like this? The pair are winning so far, so they continue to push ahead. And when we turn the page, we get a two-page reveal of Imperiax. This Imperiax, though, dwarfs everything. It isn't just bigger than Superman. It is bigger than nearby planets. Superman is like the size of Imperiax's fingernail. It looks pretty much like the smaller probes that we have been seeing so far, the only additions to its look being energy-crackling tube-like protrusions that go along its arms and shoulders. 
A halo of blue energy surrounds it, dotted with even more Imperiex probes. Behind it, Imperiex's ship floats nearby, but let's face it, we've all got our eyes on Imperiex, not his ship. Imperiex gestures, addressing the anomaly that dares to battle its probes. These insects, no, these bacteria, do not understand what Imperiex is, or that it's part of the natural order. No, it is a necessary part of the natural order. With the gesture, Doomsday is pulled up to Imperiex and is vaporized in a blast of blue energy. Only his skeleton remains. Imperiex then gestures at Superman, who it calls the true anomaly, the first creature to turn back one of its probes. Blue light begins to envelop Superman, and suddenly... He's gone. Only a small scrap of his cape is left, hanging in the vacuum. Across space, though, a portal opens and it spews out the burning Superman. He falls towards the closest planet, home of his rescuer. Apocalypse. The ending here doesn't do a lot for me. The build-up to Doomsday was great, as was Superman's inner journey as he fought alongside Superman, but the reveal of Imperiex wasn't nearly as impressive. Visually, he just looks like an extra-large version of the Imperiex that we have been seeing all the while. Sure, he's super big, but that doesn't really interest me much. There's not much that's new here. The important thing to note, though, is that Imperiex killed Doomsday with flooping ease. And if he could kill Doomsday, then he could kill Superman, too. That threat is real. Casey obviously goes with a fake-out death here, but he also isn't doing any work to make it look like it sticks. We know that Superman isn't dying here, so why pretend? Also of note is that Superman takes another loss here. He's been two steps behind this whole crossover, and while he is working to catch up, he is also taking emotional losses along the way. He didn't defeat the General, he couldn't save Topeka, he lost the League, he lost Aquaman, he's lost Steel, he's now lost his moral high ground fighting alongside Doomsday, he lost f- No swearing! Doomsday? And he nearly got burned alive! I know that he isn't the only force in this fight, but he is getting his butt kicked. And now, he has to deal with whatever crap this is on Apocalypse. This ain't going well. Our next issue is Superman, The Man of Steel, issue 116, which was written by Mark Schultz, drawn by Doug Mank, inked by Tom Wynn, and was colored by Wildstorm FX. Man, how many books have I talked about that were colored by Wildstorm FX? I mean, it's kind of either Wildstorm FX or Liquid Graphics, so yeah. Anyways, author Mark Schultz, like with our last Man of Steel issue, begins the issue with a narrative jump. Rather than vaguely picking up where we left off, with Superman heading down to Apocalypse, he instead starts somewhere else. We're still following Superman, who is looking pretty rough, but he's standing in some kind of trashed laboratory. Superman addresses someone who is off the panel, but we turn and we meet the Black Racer. But who is the Black Racer? The Racer is the DC Universe's iteration of death. He collects the fallen dead, taking them to the afterlife. He's a black man, wearing a English knight helmet, a high-collared cape, a blue and black top, leather boots, and some skis. Yeah. F- no swearing. Skis. He's got the poles and everything. The Black Racer was created by legendary storyteller Jack Kirby back in 1971 for the New Gods comic book, and I'm just gonna say it, this is one of the stupidest looking characters that I have ever seen in a comic book. I have seen bandana wearing, no nose having Wolverine. I've seen Ben Riley's designs for his Spider Man costume when he took up the role. I even bought all of Frankencastle, in which the Punisher was killed, sewn back to life as a Frankenstein monster thing, and I loved every day. No swearing. Second of it. And all of those looks are 1000% more appealing and visually compelling to me 
than this guy. That said, as the Black Racer, he is death. He is inevitable. He isn't here for Superman, though. He's here for Steel. And he gently lifts the man. But Superman won't allow it. He's lost his parents, maybe. And Aquaman, kinda. He won't lose Steel now. The racer is not swayed by this statement. Death isn't just inevitable. It's also unstoppable. Everybody dies, Superman. A golden energy begins to envelop Steel, drawing his body into the racer's weight. He begins to lift up, to leave, but Superman tries to stop him. He swings a fist at the racer's face, and the rebound from the punch sends him flying back, debris from the watchtower below hurling into space. As Superman is pummeled by it, his mind, and our narrative, recount the recent events that got us here. Imperiex had nearly killed him, but he was saved at the last second, teleported away to Apocalypse via the boom tube technology. Once there, a band of parademons scooped up his fallen body, intent on delivering it. He came to during the trip, and, thinking that he was in the arms of his enemies, Superman begins to beat the ever-loving crap out of them. A large hairy dude named Calabac jumps in then, cursing the parademons for failing to deliver the hero before he came to. He pushes Superman back for a moment, so that he can explain what's going on here. But Superman just starts to lay into him. Either Calabac is a complete pushover, or Superman is going ham because Calabac gets rocked. Until a blast of orange energy knocks Superman away from him. The ruler of Apocalypse... Darkseid has arrived. He complains that he didn't save Superman's life, referring to him rescuing Superman from Imperiex, so that he could beat up on his minions. He was saved for a higher purpose. Superman gets back up. Allies are honest with each other, he says. They don't have to force each other into the role that they need. Then he charges at Darkseid. The only reason that Superman is alive right now is because Darkseid needs him. The new god lands a few good blows, rattling Superman enough for him to pause in his assault. He grabs Superman by the neck like a bad cat and points him. Twisting black pipes lead to a suit of black and red armor with an S-shield on its chest. This is the Entropy Aegis, made from an emptied Imperiex probe outfitted with apocalyptic technology, and, when worn by Superman, it will be the perfect weapon to destroy Imperiex. And that said, we cut away. I like the contents of this story so far, but gosh, do I hate the delivery. Author Mike Schultz does a lot of time jumping with this story, but the art team does nothing to delineate a present tense moment from a past tense moment. In our last issue, penciler Mike Ringo rounded the edges of his flashback panels, and Wildstorm colored them in brown sepia tones. But here, everything is just shown in normal tones with standard boxes, only the narration helping to indicate a change in time or location. But Schultz presents all of the narration in this issue as a poem called The Black Racer's Death Song, the presentation of this works, as the poem is displayed in boxes that are made to look like a stretched-out roll of parchment. But the language of the poem is so overwrought, and the lack of punctuation makes it hard for me to find a good reading meter. The idea of presenting this story as one that is so epic that it needs to be chronicled in a poem is neat, but I bamfin hate poetry, probably more so than I hate magic. I can do literary analysis all dang day, but hand me a poem, and I'm lost. And it doesn't even rhyme. Blech. On the moon, Steel is still alive, and he's still fighting. He wants to make sure that Superman and Doomsday stopped Imperiex before he goes. So, he jury-rigs some tech together in order to scan space. He doesn't find Imperiex when he succeeds he actually finds something else. He doesn't say what it is, although he hints that it is big. Steel tries to contact Superman, but before he can, a figure teleports into the Watchtower. Their presence here cannot be revealed yet. 
The figure apologizes for needing to do this, and then they unleash a blast of energy at Steel. On Apocalypse, Darkseid continues to boast about how awesome the Entropy Aegis is and how stoked he would be to wear it. But Imperiax seems to be fascinated by Superman. So, to Superman it shall go. But this is when Superman's earpiece crackles, and he gets a part of Steel's transmission. Nice f- No swearing! Fucking work, Steel. Superman shrugs off Darkseid's grip. Despite the alliance between Darkseid and Earth slash Luthor, Superman can't bring himself to trust the despot. And more... His friend needs him, so he blasts Darkseid with some heat vision so that he can escape. Darkseid will not risk the universe on Superman's feelings. He fires his own deadly Omega Beams from his eyes, and they track after Superman as he flies. The hero dives behind the Aegis, using it as a shield, and the beams connect with it. The resulting explosion destroys the entire building that they were in. But the Aegis, Superman, and Darkseid are unharmed. Superman is impressed, but he believes that if he wore that suit, it would only benefit Darkseid in the long run. He drops the Aegis and flies to his friend. Darkseid is glad to have at least field-tested the Aegis. Withstanding his Omega Beams is no small feat. Graven, a member of the Alien Alliance, who was last seen in Man of Steel, issue 115, approaches. The Alliance's armada is being torn apart. They need relief. They need Superman in that armor now. Darkseid says that he is not to be rushed or worried. There are other options available to them. Superman streaks back to the moon, praying that he isn't too late. He flies into the watchtower, and he finds Steel, dead. Written in his own blood are the letters W-A-R-W. Warw. And this moment brings us full circle in our story. The Black Racer arrives to deliver Steel to his rest, and Superman doesn't approve. That punch that he tried? It opened up a canyon. On the moon. And the Racer is like, Dude, I'm death. I can't be stopped. You have to accept that. And Superman is like, nuh uh, cause, cause too many people have died already, right? So spare one, just one. And you know, uh, actually, Steel had something really important to tell me, something that might stop Imperiex. So just help me out this one time and just skip him, and that would be totally cool, right? And the Black Racer just stares at him. Bold of you to assume that Imperiex needs to be stopped. Would you turn back the tides? Would you stop the sun from rising? These things are part of a cycle, as death is necessary for life. It must be. As the black racer flies away, leaving a golden trail of energy behind him, Superman stares at him. And he asks, Why couldn't it have been him? The racer then passes through the various battlefields, looking for more dead. Imperiax probes tear through the armies on Earth. The general sends wave after rage of his regiments to combat and to death. In the depths of space, the alien armada crashes against the massive ship that Imperiax travels in and is scattered like waves on rocks. On Earth, even Metropolis is under attack. It's here that the racer sees one face in particular, a black man's, and it touches him. This is Willie Walker, a sergeant who was paralyzed in the Vietnam War, and whose body is the physical host for the Black Racer. Chosen by the Source, which is the DC equivalent of God but make it science fiction, Walker has sacrificed of himself twice in the name of doing the right thing. In Walker's face, the Racer sees steals for a moment, and his heart grows two sizes. Touched by the humanity that his own existence is tied to, the racer does not deliver steel to the afterlife. He turns and heads towards Apocalypse. On the Paradox ship, Adam Strange escorts Lois Lane to the teleporters. Word has been received that President Luthor wants her at the White House, so to the White House she goes. 
Lois tells him to tell Clark where she's gone if he should return, but the teleporter beam cuts her off. Just in time, too. The forces of Empirics have turned their attention to the ship. They're about to have incoming. Despite how utterly ridiculous the design of the Black Racer is, God damn, no swearing, this bit of comic didn't absolutely touch my heart. The Razor's humanity being the thing that moves him to spare steel is a fantastic touch. This is a moment where the poem is actually really effective. Quote, Even death can reach his limit. The Reaper hit the final wall, when nothing matters but the chance to lay aside the killer's call. End quote. And yes, the fact that it rhymes helps. Given that Steel is the armored Superman, I'm guessing that he's going to be the one who ends up in that entropy Aegis. Why introduce it otherwise? And I like that idea. It's a good way to save such a good character, add some depth to the Black Racer, but still leave Superman himself in a pretty rough spot. Did you notice Superman going through the stages of grief in this issue? First, he gets angry at the Black Racer over the death of Steel. Then he tries to deny him his task. Then he tries to bargain with him, then finally he accepts the loss at the very end. I'll assume that Superman gets depressed, because why wouldn't he be after all this loss, even if that isn't established in this particular issue? But this is a really great personal story raging at the heart of this crossover. For such a large event that is spread over so many issues, the Superbooks have done a really excellent job coordinating with each other and building this narrative. If you feel like they really are kicking Superman around, though, you're right. And there is a point to it, but we're going to get to that in the next episode. This issue also had the mention of a third party in this war, which really isn't surprising. Remember, this is our worlds at war with three planets on the cover. And W-A-R-W sure seems like the start of the word war world a.k.a. Pluto, a.k.a. we're talking about Brainiac 13 and his, uh, aide, I guess? Lena Luthor. Why exactly are they hiding? And why do they need to hide the fact that they're hiding? Especially when they are feeding intelligence to Luthor? We don't know yet, but I'm okay with that, as we still have the third act to get to, and there is plenty of time for Brainiac to make its move. Overall, despite my initial shell shock at the start of this issue, I dug it. Focusing on the loss of Steel is a smart move, as he is not only our first actual death, assuming that he dies, but the emotionally closest character to Superman so far. Plus, Superman isn't aware that the racer has spared Steel yet, so it's still a real death to him. But this issue really continues to humanize and ground this otherwise grand and far-reaching cosmic drama. We had some action, we had some pathos, we had some mystery and loss, and I'm just pretty happy with it overall. Next week, we end this arc on a solo issue. Namely, Superman in Action Comics issue 781. Superman returns to Earth in order to fight back with a hometown advantage but he's still just one man against a veritable army. What sacrifices will it take to save Earth, and can Superman summon the strength to make them? Join me in one week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 13.5, Our Worlds at War, Part 5. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>